welcome to Opa Gold. I'm your host, KG. With me is my co-host, Forrest. Hello. So what did you want to bring up in the pre-discussion before we read, Forrest? Because you always like to bring up stuff. Uh, Ooh, Skeleton Crew. We can talk about Skeleton Crew. Yeah, Star Wars Skeleton Crew is dropping uh, in December. So I guess there is that. Um, we don't have Disney Plus right now, though. We do not. Yeah. Um, because there's nothing of value. There's nothing of value on there right now. Uh, the Acolyte was garbage. Um, there, There's nothing really coming out in the near future. I don't even think I'm going to bother trying uh, the Agatha series. Deadpool and Wolverine was legit, though. It was fun. Yeah, that was a fun time. If you... We, several things that were decades in the making happened in that movie without spoilers. You know what the best part of that movie was? The Tiny, Tiny Wolverine? Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the montage during the end credits. Oh, uh, yeah. All the X-Men and Fantastic Four stuff. Yeah, that oh, w- oh, by the way, this is spoiler stuff. I'm really sorry. I was <laughs> trying not to do spoilers, but okay, here we go then. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just... Okay, is it really a spoiler to say that there's a montage in the end credits that's just basically a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff from the original X-Men films cut together? And Fantastic Four. It, it's and lo- fan yeah. Four stick. Yeah, it's a love letter to that era of Marvel films. Yeah, especially since Disney bought Fox and so Marvel owns all those IPs now. Which, ironically, actually, if you look back at those original X-Men films and the Fantastic Four films, Kevin Feige's name can be found in the credits. Yeah. Because he was still kind of overseeing that stuff yeah so even though marvel studios wasn't a thing yet yeah right it is interesting but uh so which uh out of the uh fox films not counting spider-man or blade or daredevil or any of those films that weren't under the fox label what was your first fox marvel movie oh x-men origins wolverine I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth, though. That was actually the very first X-Men film I watched from beginning to end. Um, and my first Marvel Fox movie was the first Fantastic Four movie. I saw it in theaters, as, as I did the second one. What's kind of funny, this just goes to show you how late to the game I was here, but what's kind of funny is that I saw X-Men Origins Wolverine first, then I watched X-Men First Class, then I got around to the first X-Men film. So technically, you could say I was going in proper chronological order. <laughs> in a way? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was technically going in chronological order. I think that's pretty funny. No, you'd have to watch Days of Future Past and then watch the first X-Men film. <laughs> Why? Because well, the timeline got reset. <laughs> yeah, eh, eh, that's debatable. That could that could be an entire recording Unlike to, to debate. you, I watched them in the proper order. I, the first X-Men film I saw was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. was so weird watching that montage and seeing Hugh Jackman because he looks... Not that he, not to say that he hasn't a- that he's aged badly, but no. he looks so young mm-hmm. during when they were showing the first X Men film but and behind the scenes. He's much small. Uh, he's much smaller in that original film. Yeah, like he, he wasn't kept, as jacked. Yeah, he kept getting more and more jacked <laughs> as the movies progressed. It's pretty insane what he looks like by the time of the Wolverine. Yeah. I, I, th- I just thought it was funny, like, watching that behind the scenes because they had a moment where he was doing an inter- behind the scenes interview and he was like, and he was talking about how nervous he was. Mm-hmm. How he was, af- he was afraid that he wouldn't be able to pull off playing Wolverine. And I'm like, man. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah. now people are like, they don't want anyone else to play Wolverine. No. And uh, there's only ever been one, at least, live action dude. Well, you yeah. Know, a, one guy in live action who's done Wolverine. I think that's a why people are so afraid of changing actors because it's not like Batman. Batman's had like five different live action actors. Same with Superman. Mm-hmm. Same with um. Oh geez, the Joker even. The you know, Joker. Had multiple actors. Yes, but with Wolverine, it's only been one dude, like yeah. you said. So it's like people are like, don't want to give him up. Yeah, they're gonna make him do it till he's ninety. 90. <laughs> Although. I've been watching this scene with Henry Cavill, and I'm like, I can see it if they mm-hmm. if Marvel decides to choose him. Yeah. Although I did see a post that's, that pointed out this this actor who would have who uh, is Canadian mm-hmm. and has this and is the same height mm. as comic accurate Wolverine. Oh, funny, nice. <laughs> and he's all, but he's also 
well built. Yeah, yeah. And someone's like, and he's a lesser known actor, so someone's like, hey, what about this dude? He's mm-hmm. lesser known. Give him a give him a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I we'll see. Yeah. Um, I I I mean, we all thought Logan was his last time, and that's what Hugh Jackman thought too. And then this happens, so who knows? He I've, could just come back as Wolverine again in some other story. Might not even be the same version from Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, so. maybe maybe it'll tie in with Secret Wars. Maybe we'll have two versions of Wolverine. <laughs> that would be funny. Uh, clearly, we're getting two versions of, well, not necessarily two versions, but Robert Downey Jr. is coming back. Yeah. Which, by the way, someone pointed out that the fact that they announced that Robert Downey Jr. is coming um, back to the MCU this time to play Doctor Doom completely spoils the fact that <laughs> that watch it Tony Stark died in Endgame. So <laughs> it's kind of funny because that that announcement was one massive spoiler in and of itself for I mean, anyone who, has, who who hasn't seen it after five years. Or they'll just think know. Tony Stark is becoming a villain. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Either way. Um, so we're on chapter 25 of yeah, the first can, book of Jedi on. Academy. Let's move on from Marvel, from Disney Marvel and move on to Disney Star Wars. <laughs> but this isn't Disney Star Wars. To label it as such is quite blasphemy. I was just, be- I was just trying to have a good segue for us. You, can't, you gotta just... You well, gotta... it didn't work because <laughs> Star Wars and Disney Star Wars are two different things. I know. Just let me have this <laughs> lab, this, please. Except Andor. Andor goes in Star Wars. <laughs> No, it can stay in Disney Star Wars where it belongs. Nope, <laughs> nope it belongs. In you guys Disney can't Star. see it because uh, this is strictly audio, but my Andor Steelbook is sitting proudly on my shelf next to us. Where is it? It's a beautiful. It it's a, no, no, <laughs> KG. No, Just keep away from the shelf. Do not t- nip KG. No. Okay, I'm not you. doing anything. He's just making it up. Uh huh. <laughs> for dramatic. You didn't have effect. to explain that. It's like explaining the joke after you made the. Punch well, I just line. don't want people to think I'm like that. I wouldn't touch the steel book. Without you, you now. Without you knowing. It's like after I bought. Uh, it's like after <laughs> I bought my set of season one of Titans. She was like threatening to burn it. No, I was threatening to hide it. Not and then I would burn it after. <laughs> yeah, I did then it. I would. I would hide it. What are you talking about? I would hide it uh, instead. And then burn it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to chapter 25 of Jedi Search. We're getting really close towards the end. Fantastic. Um, I think just a couple more chapters and then we'll be able to do our finale live stream. Finale live stream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, nice butcher there. <laughs> butcher it. <laughs> All right, and let's continue. Han rolled over with a groan in the detention cell. The hard ridges on the surface of his bunk, Han thought of them as discomfort stripes, made sleep itself a nightmare. He awoke from a dream about Leia, perhaps the only enjoyment he had experienced in three weeks. The dim reddish light filtered down, hurting his eyes without providing useful illumination. He blinked his eyes open, hearing people move outside his cell door, the clank of stormtrooper boots on the floor gratings, muffled voices. The cyber lock clicked as someone activated the password code. He sat up, suddenly alert. His body ached, his mind still buzzed from the interrogation drugs, but he tensed as the doors opened. He had no idea what this was, but he felt certain he wouldn't like it. Corridor light flitted in, and Kwee Zuck stood beside an armed stormtrooper. She looked battered and abused by her own thoughts, which gave Han a smug grin. He hoped she had lost a lot of sleep after learning of the devastating use to which her inventions had been put. She might be able to fool herself, but she couldn't fool him. What have you come back to dis- uh, well, that was, that well, was awful. Yep. <laughs> what? Have you come back to discuss a few moral issues, Doc? Am I supposed to be your conscience? Kui crossed her pale bluish arms over her chest. Admiral Dalla has given me permission to interrogate you again, she said coldly, though her body language did not match her tone. She turned to the guard, her pearlescent hair sparkling in the dim corridor. Would you accompany me inside for, an inter- for the interrogation, Lieutenant? I'm afraid the, pri- I'm afraid the prisoner might not cooperate. Yes, Dr. Sucks. The guard said, following her into the cell. Dr. Sucks. Zucks. Zucks. Yes, Dr. Zucks. The guard (coughs) said... The guard... (coughs) Sorry. I'm good. (laughs) The guard said, following her into the cell. He slid the door partially closed behind him. While his back was turned, Kui withdrew a blaster from the utility pocket on her smock, pointed it at the guard, and fired a stun blast. Rippling arcs of blue fire surrounded him, then faded as he crumpled to the floor. Han leaped to his feet. What are you doing? Kui stepped over the fallen stormtrooper. 
The previous day, she had seemed more fragile. The Imperial issue heavy blaster pistol looked huge in her delicate hand. <clears throat> Admiral Dalla is mobilizing this entire fleet in less than a day. She plans to take the Sun Crusher and her four Star Destroyers to wipe out the New Republic. Your friend Kip Dern is also scheduled for termination this afternoon. She raised her feathery eyebrows. Does that add up? Does that add up? Does that add up to enough of an excuse to escape as soon as we can? Han's mind reeled. At the moment, all he could think of was seeing Kip and Chewbacca again, then getting back to Coruscant so he could be reuni reunited with Leia and the twins. I don't have any appointments I couldn't be persuaded to cancel. Good, said Quee said. Any questions? Han smirked as he began to pull on his disguise of stormtrooper armor. No, I'm used to doing this sort of thing. Kip could sense the difference in the air, his first indication that his efforts to focus the force were actually accomplishing something. He studied every slight change in air currents, in the sluggish odors around the cell, the myriad, the myriad tiny sounds that echoed throughout, through the metal walls. Stretching his mind through the invisible webs of the force, Kip could feel a surge from the, pa from the guards when they walked past his cell. He could sense a twinge each time someone dispensed the food tray through the door, but their attitudes had changed. Over the whole ship, he could catch faint ripples of activity, tension, growing anxiety. Something was about to happen. Closer at hand, he understood a, d a deeper, gut-wrenching truth. The emotions had been so clear in the, guard station, in the guard station beside his door the previous sleep period. Kip Dern was not to be a part of whatever activity the Star Destroyers were preparing. A young, a young man from the spice mines of Kessel could, not pro could provide no useful information. They had no reason to keep him alive. Admiral Dalla had already scheduled Kip's termination. He had m not much longer to live. His lips curled back in an angry snarl. The Empire had been trying to destroy him all his life, and now they were about to succeed. When he heard voices outside his door, he sensed the barrage of their uneasiness, the curdling plans of violence behind the forefront of their minds. He had no way to defend himself. Despairing, Kip, Kip slid his head against the cool metal wall of the door, trying to pick out a few select words of the conversation. Scheduled for execution this afternoon. Know that. We are... Take him. Admiral... Authorization right here. Irregular. Why want him? Weapons test. Target. New concept. Vital to the fleet's newer armaments. Right away. Need specific. Only a general authorization. No. Good enough. The voices rose, but Kip couldn't make out more of, this, of the words. He tried to decipher three talking... He tried to decipher three voices talking all at once. Kip made ready to lash out the moment the door slid open. He knew he would be cut down by blaster fire in no time, but at least it would be over, and he would be shot in his own terms, not the Empire's. Check with first. Wait. Suddenly, Kip heard a thump and a muffled blast. A heavy object smashed against the doorway. Kip flinched back as the door was open. The dead stormtrooper guard sprawled backwards into his cell with a clatter of white armor. A smoking hole oozed steam from the waist joint in the brittle uniform. Another stormtrooper stepped inside, holding the still warm blaster pistol. Beside him stood a willowy alien woman, looking delicate but outraged at the same time. I hope that was sufficient authorization, the stormtrooper said, then pulled off his helmet. Han! Kip cried. I really hate red tape, Han said, nudging the dead guard with his foot. Think you can fit into that uniform, kid? No, I don't want to. No, I don't want one of the of the slow old ones. Quee snapped at the keeper of the Wookiee work detail. Through the narrowed field of view in his stormtrooper helmet, Han watched the delicate woman play the part of a tough, impatient researcher. The rotund man glanced at his hairy charges, unintimidated as if he were accustomed to being shouted at by prima donna scientists. The keeper's face looked like pale, wet clay. Han fidgeted, sweating in the cramped uniform. The helmet had nose filters, but the suit still smelled of body odor from its former owner. The stormtroopers at Monstellation lived in their uniforms, and likely disinfected the interiors much less often than they polished the exteriors. The keeper shrugged, as if Quee's impatience did not concern him. These Wookiees have been worked hard for over a decade. What do you expect from them? They're all slow and worthless. They're all. They're all slow and worthless. Han could see that most of the other Wookiees wandering around the hangar bay had patchy fur and stooped shoulders, bringing them almost to the height of a human. These slaves looked as if their will had been crushed over years of harsh servitude. I don't want to hear your excuses, Kui said. She tossed her head, making the feathery pearls of her hair shimmer. We've been ordered to get a lot of work done before the fleet departs, and I need a Wookiee with some energy. Give me that new prisoner you have. He'll do the work. 
Not a good idea, the keeper said, wrinkling his pasty forehead. He's unruly, and you'd have to double-check his work. Can't trust him not to try sabotage. I don't care how unruly he can get, Quee snapped. At least he won't fall asleep on the job. On the far side of the bay, a tall wookie stepped out of a Gamma-class assault shuttle. He straightened from the cramped quarters and looked around the bay. Han had to force himself not to yank off his helmet and call out Chewbacca's name. The Wookiee seemed ready to strike, barely restraining himself from flying into a suicidal rage. With his bare hands, Chewbacca could dismantle five or six TIE fighters before the stormtroopers took him down. The Keeper glanced at Chewbacca, as if considering. I have authorization from Admiral Dalla herself, Kui said, holding out a curled hard copy bearing Dalla's seal. Han glanced at the other stormtrooper standing guard in the engine pool. He could not invoke the same violent authorization he had used to spring Kip Dern from his cell. But beside Kui Zux, Quip, wearing the smaller of the two stolen new stormtrooper uniforms, stood stock still. Han knew the kid must be terrified, but Kip had snapped to attention and done everything Han suggested. Han felt a rush of warmth inside, and he hoped Kip could get out of here to, to the normal life he deserved. All right, but you take him at your own risk, the keeper finally said. I won't be responsible if he ruins whatever you have him working on. He whistled and motioned for a pair of stormtroopers to bring Chewbacca over. The Wookiee growled in anger, glaring around with hard, dark eyes. He did not recognize Han, nor did he know Kui Zux. Chewbacca glared at them, resenting another assignment. A little more cooperation, the Keeper yelled, then struck out with his energy lash, burning a smoking welt across Chewbacca's shoulder blades. The Wookiee howled and snarled, but somehow, but somehow restrained himself as the other stormtroopers hauled out their blasters, ready to stun him if he went wild. Han tensed, <clears throat> Han tensed, clenching his fists as much as the armored gloves would allow. More than anything, he wanted to shove the generating handle of the energy lash down on the Keeper's throat and switch it on full power. But instead, Han stood at attention, doing nothing, saying nothing, like a good stormtrooper. <clears throat> The four of them marched out of the hangar bay. The keeper ignored them as he strode to the other captive Wookiees and began to strike left and right with his energy lash, venting his anger. Han felt his stomach nodding. Chewbacca kept looking from side to side, as if searching for his chance to escape. Han just hoped they could get someplace private before the big, before the big Wookiee decided to tear them all apart. The doors closed, leaving them in a harshly lit white corridor. Chewie! Han said, pulling off his stormtrooper helmet. After breathing through the sour nose filters, even the musky scent of a Wookiee smelled sweet to him. Chewbacca bleated in delight, surprise, and grabbed Han in a huge hug, wrapping his wrapping hairy arms around him and lifting him off the floor. Han gasped for breath, grateful for the for the protection of the armor. Put me down, he said, trying to stop himself from chuckling. If somebody sees you, they'll think you're killing me. Wouldn't that be a stupid reason to get blasted? Chewbacca agreed and lowered him back to the floor. Now what? No, more like, now oh, yeah. what? Now what? Han asked Kui. If you can pilot us out of here, we can escape, Kui said. Han grinned. If that's our only problem, we're home free. I can pilot any ship. Just give me the chance. Then let's get out of here, she said. Time is running out. When they boarded the shuttle back down to Ma installation, Han could ask no further questions. Surrounded by other stormtroopers rigidly minding their own business, neither he nor, Qu nor Kip could speak with Kui. Casual conversation seemed forbidden. Kui fidgeted, looking at shuttle the shuttle walls, the narrow window showing the deadly barrier of the Ma itself with its secret pathways, if they could escape. Han desperately wanted to see Leia and the twins again. Han desperately wanted to see Leia and the twins again. They filled his thoughts more and more, preoccupying him at times when he should have fixed every iota of attention on the peril around him. He ached to hold Leia again, but thinking of her while he <clears throat> but thinking of her while he wore a stormtrooper uniform seemed to taint the emotion. Beside him sat Kip, unreadable behind a stormtrooper mask, but the eye holes of the helmet continued to turn toward Han, as if seeking reassurance. Han wished she had more to offer, but he did but he did not know Kui's plan. Why were they returning? Why were they returning to Ma installation, rather than just stealing a ship and racing off into space? It would be a breakneck run, no matter when they started, and Admiral Dalla's attack preparations grew more complete with each hour. Han had to warn the New Republic of the disaster about to befall it. First, he had been concerned about the concentration of space power around Kessel, but the fleet of four Star Destroyers and the Ma's installation's secret weapons looked infinitely worse than whatever Morath Duel had pieced together from the scrap heap. 
Chewbacca wore mechanics overalls, looking like a worker assigned to perform maintenance on some piece of equipment down in one of the laboratories. He made grunting sounds to himself, content to be re reunited with his friends, but anxious for action. Kui remained uncommunicative, keeping her thin bluish hands folded in her lap. Han wondered if he had gone too far in his accusations of her naivete and the evil nature of her work. He wished he knew what she was thinking. When the shuttle landed in one of the installation's asteroids and the stormtroopers disembarked, Kui led Han and Kip and Chewbacca away from the rocky hangar through a tunnel high enough to allow the movement of ships. This way, she said. Han did not recognize where she was taking them. Aren't we going back to your lab, Doc? Kui froze in mid-step before turning to him. No, never again. Then she moved on. When they reached a tall metal doorway guarded by two stormtroopers standing at detention, Kui took out her badge again, flashing the imprinted holograms in the light. The stormtroopers straightened to attention. Open up for me, Kui said. Yes, Dr. Sachs. The head guard said. Your badge, please? She handed him her badge with a barely controlled smile. Han began to grow uneasy. These guards recognized Kui by sight, and she seemed more comfortable now than she had been during other parts of their, esca other parts of their escape. Was this some kind of treachery? But to what purpose? He and Kip turned toward each other, but the stormtrooper helmets kept their expressions unreadable. The Wookiee he the Wookiee is here to do heavy maintenance on the engines, a complete coolant overhaul before tomorrow's deployment of the fleet, Kui said. These two guards are especially trained to prevent him from acting up. This Wookiee has caused some damage before, and we can't, and we can't afford delays. Han tried not to cringe. Kui was talking too quickly, letting her nervousness show through. Just give me the proper authorizations, the guard said. You know the routine. He slid her badge through a scanner to log Kui in, then handed it back to her. The stormtrooper seemed unconcerned as if glad to be posted here that, rather than in the middle of frantic preparations for deployment. Kui went to the door's data terminal and punched up a request. Then she handed him the card copy printout of Admiral Dalla's, of Admiral Dalla's permission again. Han wondered how many times she was going to use the same piece of paper. There, you'll see the approved work request for the Wookiee with a notation for special handlers. It's been authorized by Tol Sivrin himself. The guard shrugged. As usual, let me scan the service numbers of these two troopers. Then you're free to go in. He entered Han and Kip's numbers, then worked the door controls. The great steel creek doors to ground deep to each side, revealing a hangar lit by levitating globes of light. Overhead, wide rectangular skylights let in the eerie glow of swirling gases around the maw. <clears throat> Kui stepped inside the chamber, and her whole demeanor changed, as if she had suddenly turned breathless. Han, Kip, and Chewbacca followed. The guards worked his controls, and the doors slid closed, sealing them inside. Kui visibly relaxed. Han stood up at a ship like none he had ever seen before. Smaller than the Millennium Falcon, this craft was oblong and faceted, like a long shard of crystal. Its armor pulsal lifts kept it upright, with an actual ladder leading to the open hatch. Defensive lasers bristled from every corner Defensive lasers bristled from the corners of its facets. The armor plating was multicolored and shimmering, like a constantly changing pool of oil and molten metal. At the lower vertex hung at the lower vertex hung the oddly fuzzy torus of an immensely powerful Renaissance torpedo transmitter. Though not much larger than a fighter craft, the sun crusher hummed with deadly, with deadly potential. We're going to steal that? Han cried. Of course, Kwezok said. It's the greatest weapon ever devised, and I've spent eight years of my life designing it. You didn't expect, you didn't expect me to leave it here with Fram Dalla, did you? All right. With that, that was chapter 25 of yep. Jedi Search. Yep. KG, do you have anything else to say other than the fact that this is a re-record? <laughs> Big all, plot all, twist. All I am just grateful for is that we didn't have to re-record the whole thing and that the our discussion of Deadpool and Wolverine made it in because it was a great discussion. Yes, it was. All right. Well, um, that being said, be sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you guys next week. Apologies for the delay. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye.